So here we are, uh, hopefully you're in chapter 20 of Deuteronomy. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the adventure of just going through the entire Bible, just verse by verse. And here we are near the end of the Pentateuch, those five first books of Moses. And here is this, in this fifth book, he's reminding us, this book of remembrance. Don't forget what I've told you. And Lord, how often we forget what you tell us. In fact, we remember the things we ought to forget, and then we forget the things we ought to remember. How foolish, how sad. And so forgive us, Lord. We want to we remember your good truths and we want to put them into our life. So teach us tonight once again. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. All God's people said, amen. amen. I received a, <clears throat> an email some time ago and it talked about this guy. He says, I was recently, recently diagnosed with AAADD. I was like, AAADD? Yeah, it's, it's Age Activated Attention Deficit Order. So check this out. So he gives one of his days, he jots this down. I decided to wash the car. I start towards the garage and I notice the mail on the table. Okay, I'm gonna wash the car, but first I gotta go through the mail. I lay the keys down on the desk and discard the junk mail and notice the trash can is full. Okay, I'll put the bills down on the desk and I'll take the trash can out. And since I'm going near the mailbox anyway, I'll pay these bills first. Now where's my checkbook? Oh yeah, I left the checks over there. So I have extra check, checks in the desk, and uh, wait a second, I was drinking a Coke, uh, but I'm still looking for those checks. But the first thing I need to do is put my Coke away from the computer. So I'll pop it in the fridge for later. I head towards the kitchen, and my flowers catch my eye. They need some water. I set the Coke on the counter. Oh yeah, I need my glasses. There they are. I've been looking them since this morning. I fill a container of water and head towards the flower pots. Ah, someone left the TV remote on, in the kitchen. I'll never think to look at for it in the kitchen later tonight, so I better put it back in the living room where it belongs. I splash some water in the pots and onto the floor. I throw the remote into the soft cushion of the sofa. I head back to the hall, trying to figure out what it was I was doing. He then writes, the end of the day, the car is not washed, the bills aren't paid, the Coke is on the kitchen counter, the flowers are half water, the checkbook is still only has one check in and I can't seem to find my car keys. And then he writes, I realize I have a serious condition and I need help. But before that, I've got a lot of other things to do. <laughs> I, I just read that, I laughed because you too might have AAADD. Um, the fact is whether you're young or old, we lived in such a fast-paced society, and so many things are, you know, bidding for our time. Um, and that happens with all of us. We can get distracted then from doing the things God wants us to do, right? That happens. And so as we come to the book of Deuteronomy, understand the ancient Jews didn't have all the modern inconveniences or we call them actually conveniences, but they're really inconveniences when you think about it because they distract us. They didn't have that. But they could be distracted by other things that would still keep them from doing the things God wanted them to do. So God has Moses pen down the book of Deuteronomy in order to reiterate what he wants them to remember and to do. And so again, that's what we've entitled our whole study here. But we're going to be looking at chapters 20 to 23 tonight. And, and I would entitle this section, Rules of Engagement. Uh, because Moses is expressing God's heart concerning many rules in this area. Rules of warfare, rules of marriage, and sometimes those are the same, right? Marriage, warfare, uh, property, and a host of other subjects. You'll see that as we move through here. So let's jump into chapter 20. This chapter is dedicated to warfare. God's people, remember now, they've come just to the edge of the promised land. They're going to take possession soon, and they're going to be going to war. So much of what we come to the book of Joshua, is, it's all about war. Now, is that relatable to us? Well, yes. I mean, we're in a spiritual warfare. And we're, until we go home to be with Jesus, this is the way it is. In fact, in our prayer service on Sunday, that's what we focused on was our spiritual warfare and the different armor. And we prayed about that as a body. And by the way, if you weren't there, we prayed for you because we prayed for the whole church to be armed and ready. So there are some principles we can glean from here. So he says this, first of all, when you go out to battle against your enemies and you see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, don't be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up, by the way, from the land of Egypt. So look, God allowed you to go out of this big nation, and by the way, they were a very small nation, by the way, they still are today. Israel is only the size of New Jersey. It's amazing how God has protected them, right? 
But God says, when you go out, don't be afraid. The Lord is with you. That's the, that's the issue. Listen, God never minimized the size of the opponents. He said, oh, yeah, they're much bigger than you. Oh, yeah, they're well, you don't have a chance unless you trust in me. Then you can. So God says, get your eyes off of the physical battle and, and the enemy and put them on me. So it shall be when you're on the verge of battle that the priest shall approach and speak to the people. And he shall say to them, hear, O Israel, today you're on the verge of battle with your enemies. Don't let your heart faint. Don't be afraid. Don't tremble or be terrified because of them. Again, you need, he, he strengthened him. The priest would come and encourage the people, encourage the people. Strengthen them and trust Jesus. That's why we need to be in church. As Christians, I don't have to go to church. Well, yeah, you are commanded to be in church. It tells you that in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. But we need it because we get strengthened. We get encouraged. I get pumped. I'm like, yes, right? For the Lord your God, he goes with you to fight against your enemies to save you. It's the Lord doing it, right? And I love Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who could be against us? Well, there's a lot that come against us, but they don't have a chance, right? It was uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt who said, the only thing we have to fear is what? Fear itself, right? And, and fear can paralyze people. It does. That's why if you go on these various places of phobias, there's... there's Tens of thousands of phobias, right? People are fearful of things. And fear can mobilize a person and fear can mobilize a nation, right? It could, it could cripple them. But it can also, there is a fear that can empower a nation. You know what kind of fear that is? It's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord, trusting in the Lord, right? So if the priests speak to the people, the officer spoke to the people. And uh, listen, no officer wants to lead an army to battle if they're not battle ready. So the officers give, order, uh, give orders, and, and there were actually three opportunities of exemption because, you know, if you're a captain of a, a group of men, uh, you know, going to battle, you don't want some people that are fearful or just can't handle it. You want to go out with people that have got faith and are trusting, right? So the officers then speak to the people in verse 4, saying, what man is there who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man dedicate it. If there's a man who's planted a vineyard, has not eaten of it, let him go, return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man eat it. If a man is there who is betrothed to a woman, he's engaged, he hasn't married her yet, let him go, return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another marry her. So God gave three exemptions, homes, harvests, and honeymoons. That's pretty good. <clears throat> God, think about this, God was concerned for the blessings of life, just as much as the battles of life. Besides, the size of the army wasn't important. The size of the army was never important to God. Is the heart of the people, heart of the people. That said, he gives one more exemption. Here it is. The officers shall speak further to people and say, what man is there who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go home, return to his house, lest his heart cause the heart of the brethren to faint as well. First of all, we need to understand this. Fear and faith cannot coexist. Did you know that? Fear and faith cannot coexist. And here's the thing. Fear is contagious, right? Have you ever been around someone's fear? I don't know if I could do that. Oh, you're right. Maybe we can. That's exactly what happened to the children of Israel first time around, 40 years ago when they were on the border. But you know what? I also know that <clears throat> faith is contagious too. Faith is contagious. Man, you get around a saint, you get around someone that's amped for Jesus, I love being around my wife. She's amped for Jesus all the time. She really is. And man, she's like, uh, man, I, you're right. Let's do, let's do it. You know, and I know other Christians like that. I hope you do. I want to be that kind of Christian. He's got his faith and his eyes on Jesus because that is contagious. Again, another reason why we fellowship together. So it shall be, verse 9, when the officers have finished speaking to the people that they should make captains and armies to lead the people. Now, moving on, we have the battle instructions. Verses 10 through 15, you have instructions concerning the nations outside of Canaan. Verses 16 and 18, you have Canaan itself. First, if they go out to battle outside of the promised land. When you go near a city and fight against it, then proclaim and offer peace to it. In other words, no need to fight unnecessarily. Give the city an opportunity to surrender. And it shall be if they accept your offer of peace and open to you, then the people who are found in it can be placed under tribute of you and serve you. But if that city will not make peace with you but makes war against you, then you besiege it. That was the typical battle scenario. An opposing army will surround a city, cut off its supplies, uh, 
weaken those within its walls. It usually took years, but it was very effective. And when the Lord your God delivers it into your hands, you shall strike every male in it with the edge of the sword. But the women, little ones, livestock, all that's in the city, it's spoil. You shall plunder for yourself, and you shall eat your neighbor's, <clears throat> you shall eat your enemy's plunder, which the Lord God gives you. So to those outside of the promised land, there was mercy to women, children, and they take plunder. That would underwrite the expense of the battle. And thus you should do all the cities which are very far from you, very important, which are not the cities of these nations. But when you come to the promised land, the cities of these people which the Lord God gives you as an inheritance, you shall let nothing that breathes remain alive. You shall utterly destroy the Hittite, Amorite, Canaanite, Perizzite, Hivite, Jebusite, even termites. doesn't say that, but all of them. Lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations which they have done for their gods and you sin against the Lord your God. And so we've covered this so many times. God was wiping out this people for hundreds of, because for hundreds of years they had turned away from them. Uh, they murdered their children in human sacrifice. There was all kinds of, uh, they slept with animals. There was male and female prostitutes. It was a, it's a profane society. And God said you wipe them out lest you learn of their ways. Unfortunately, they did as time went on. That was the tragic thing. But certainly, <clears throat> if we were to look at what you know, they uh, encompassed in this, these, this worldly territory, we deal with in the world all the time. That's the world. The world is vile. The world is, the world is perverted. And uh, God tells us in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, come out from among them. Come out from among the world and be separate unto me, says the Lord. We are to be different. We are to be holy, for he is holy. We are to live separate lives unto him. We are to look different. We are to be different. We are to go against the flow of the world. That's, that's the calling. Now, finally, Moses closes the chapter saying, when you besiege a city for a long time, making war against it to take it, you shall not destroy its trees by wielding an axe against them. If you can eat of them, do not cut them down to use in the siege, for the tree is the field and it's man's food. Only the trees which you know are not trees for food you may destroy and cut down to build siege works against the city and make war until it's subdued. So when you're besieging a city, obviously you would use lots of wood. You would uh, cut down trees for ramparts, for battering rams, for the scaffolding, uh, for fuel. And God says, be careful, because eventually you're going to live in that land, and you don't want to cut off all the fruit trees, because, you know, that's what you're going to eat. So in other words, battle, battling involves common sense. And I think we need to understand that spiritually. We're looking we're in a spiritual battle, but it also involves common sense. Use common sense. You don't say, I'm invincible for Jesus. If God is for me, who can be against me? Well, you don't go walking at 2 o'clock in the morning in a bad part of town. You're just tempting God. That, that's not using common sense, right? Now, chapter 21 <clears throat> begins with unsolved homicide. It's an interesting subject. Again, all these laws reiterated. If anyone is found slain, lying in the field, in the land, which the Lord your God is giving you to possess, and it is not known who killed him, then your elders, your judges, shall go out and measure the distance from the slain man to the surrounding cities. Why? Because the, the city closest to the corpse would be the one who would handle the proceedings. It shall be the elders of the city nearest the slain man shall take a heifer, which has not been worked, and which has not been pulled with a yoke. So you take a, this, this cow, this heifer, that's, that's never uh, seen any work, and it's set aside to God to atone for the land. To atone for the land for someone murdered. What do you mean? Well, listen, the first murder found in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 10, God says this of Cain who murdered his brother Abel. Your brother's blood cries out from the very ground. Sin left to itself must be atoned for or it defiles the land. So in verses 4 to 6, they sacrifice this heifer. Then in verse 7, <clears throat> then they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, nor have our eyes seen it. So afterwards, if they can't solve the case, they are to wash their hands. And by doing so, they're asking for, for you know, forgiveness. To provide atonement, O Lord, for your people of Israel, verse 8, whom you've redeemed. And do not lay innocent blood to the charge of your people of Israel. And atonement shall be provided on the behalf of their, for the blood. So you shall put away the guilt of the innocent blood from among uh, you when you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Now, let me say this. If they wash their hands but didn't do everything in their power to actually try and solve the murder, 
well, then God wouldn't atone for them. And I say that because this is exactly what Pilate did after he examined Jesus. Pilate examines Jesus. He washes his hands knowing full well that he was an innocent man, yet he put him, uh, you know, penalized him to go to the cross. Now, moving on, we have rules concerning female captives. When you go out to war against the enemies and the Lord your God delivers them into your hand and you take them captive and you see among the captives a beautiful woman and desire her and would take her for your wife, then you shall bring her home to your house and she shall shave her head and trim her nails. She shall put off the clothes of her captivity, remain in your house, mourn her father and mother for a full month. After that you may go unto her to be your husband and she shall be your wife. And it shall be if she have no delight in her, <clears throat> then you shall set her free. But you certainly shall not sell her for money, nor shall you treat her brutally, because you have humbled her. So there are actually quite a few guidelines here. One, the captive woman has to humble herself. She has to be shaved, trims herself. It, it denoted a break with her past, and now a beginning anew. Uh, she had to show a change of allegiance. Uh, her former clothes taken away. She's given new ones. She had to mourn her past, so she's given a month to resolve issues of her past family life, right? And, and I, I bring these out because really, when you think about it, in a similar way, God calls us when he takes us, you know, out of the world. When God takes us out of the world, one, we have to humble ourselves. Number two, we must change our allegiance. It's no longer for the world, it's for him alone. And we mourn our past sins and we're joined to Christ. Finally, though, we are told here this woman was protected. If for any reason her potential husband changes his mind, he can't sell her as a slave. He can't treat her brutally. He literally just lets her go free. And so here I just want you to see how God had concern for the rights of women, even captive women. No culture, no culture prior to this ever did that. Now, moving on, Moses reiterates rules of inheritance. Now, and he begins with this. If a man has two wives, well, that's a real problem. One loved and the other unloved. Of course, that's going to happen. That's polygamy, right? Listen, God never intended a man or a woman to have two husbands, a man to have many wives. God's original design was one man with one woman for life. But you only have to go as far as Genesis 4.19. Can you believe that? Only as far as chapter 4 of Genesis 4.19. And it says Lamech had two wives, Ada and Zillah. So he had wives from A to Z. That's all I say. <laughs> did God approve it? The answer is no, God did not. God tolerated it. And at time, it manifested its own problems. We, we know it did with Abraham. Ooh, man, that guy had problems on his hands with the wives and then the, oh my goodness, right? But just like this man, because you're not going to love one as much as the other. So this is what Moses says. This is how it's, he brings up laws of inheritance. And he says this. If they both bear him children, and both the loved and the unloved, and if the firstborn son is of her who is unloved, it shall be on the day that he bequeaths his possessions to his sons, he must not bestow firstborn status on the son of the loved wife in preference to the son of the unloved, the true firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his. So no, it doesn't matter what wife he has. The point was this. He's trying to reiterate laws of inheritance. The, the double portion goes to the first son. Now, it's interesting, and I bring that out, and God put it even in his law. Yet, as we look at redemptive history, God himself would actually bypass the status of the firstborn and give it to the second he did it with Isaac over uh, Ishmael. He did it with Jacob over Esau. He did it with Ephraim over Manasseh. And uh, I found that that's always the case. Now listen to this. That's always the case spiritually. God doesn't recognize your first birth. I mean, he recognizes it. But you know what he blesses? Your second birth. That's the double portion. The second birth. Now moving on, Moses addresses the issue of a rebellious child. <clears throat> Pretty radical passage. If you're a young person, pay attention. If you're listening to my line, pay attention. Listening to a message later, pay attention. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them. So this is not negligent parents. This is a, a stubborn child who, even though his parents have sought to set them right, discipline them. That's the case here. 
that the, the parents actually love the child because they chasten him. Yet in spite of that, the child doesn't heed. Then the father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of the city. That's, that was the courthouse we've talked about before. Is always at the gate of the city. And they shall say to the elders of the city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. By the way, the word son here in Hebrew does not refer to a young child. This is not a young child. This is a young adult. Far past the age of accountability. Far past the opportunity of having multiple times to change. But has rejected that. Then the men of the city shall take, <clears throat> shall stone him to death with stones. Why? So you shall put away the evil from among you. Wow. And it says all Israel shall hear and fear. In other words, you do that. You don't have to do that all the time. Would you realize that? That wasn't happening all the time. Probably once or twice. That's all it would take. You realize if we did something like that, and I know some of you are going, <gasps> listen, if we did something like that in our culture with young adults, and by the way, that's the, that's the area of crime. Crime is, takes, the highest crime is 40% higher in our nation than anywhere else of males in their 20s. 20 to 40% higher than other nations. That's when it happens. That's, that's the truth. But if you did that, I tell you what, <clears throat> that would only happen a few times. Then people go, uh, I don't think I want to do that. Yeah, exactly. So, let's move on. <clears throat> um, where are we? Chapter 21 ends by saying, if a man has committed a sin deserving a death, he is to be put to death and hung on a tree. Now, this is kind of interesting. This is not a, this is not a Texas hanging. You know, what I mean by that is he wasn't put to death by strangulation. That was a Texas hanging, right? Or uh, Wild Wild West hanging. Um, rather, <clears throat> when a crime was so horrible in ancient times, whether it was murder or rape or something, uh, he would be put to death and then he would be hung on the tree. It would be hung on the tree. It, it was a, a, a form of humiliation and shame. And God says, though, but when you do that, his body shall not remain overnight. It's just up there for the day. You shall surely bury him that day so that you don't defile the land which the Lord God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hung on a tree is accursed of God. So God here, even with taking a life, tempered it with mercy. But later on, of course, we know that the Apostle Paul applied this to Jesus Christ, our Savior. In Galatians 3.13, 3, uh, 3, it says this. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. He became a curse for us, as it is written, cursed is everyone hung on a tree. So Jesus exposed himself to the shame and to the humiliation of the cross. And then, by the way, it says in the latter part of that verse that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. He gave all so we could receive all. Now we come to chapter 22, and this chapter begins with rules of kindness. Rules of kindness to others. Uh, you, shall see, you shall not see your brother's ox or sheep going astray and hide yourself from them. You certainly bring it back to your brother. And if your brother is not near to you or you don't know him, then you shall bring it to your own house and it shall remain there until your brother is seeking for it. Hey, I lost my ox a while ago. Do you have it? Yeah, I do. It's right here in the living room. No, I don't know if you put it there, but <laughs> you store it. You shall do the same with his donkey. Do the same with his garment. Or with anything lost of your brother's which he has lost and you found it, you do likewise. Don't hide it for yourself. You shall see your brother's donkey or his ox fall down the road and hide yourself from him. No, you shall surely help him. Lift him up again. So this is simply uh, principles of, of kindness that are very obviously, you know, if you see your brother in need, help him. Don't go, hey, finders keepers, losers weepers. No, that, I don't know where that came from. That's something kind of strange and weirdly American. No, we would, we would... <laughs> Keep that for somebody and hope says, that's why we have a lost and found at church, right? Now, one thing I have to say about lost and found at church as I think about it. How is it possible that Bibles could be in the lost and found for weeks at a time? This is something I do not understand. Shouldn't that be something like the next day, Monday, you're going to reach your Bible? For Where's my Bible? I think I'll call the church office. But no. So I'm just... <clears throat> So don't ever admit you lost your Bible, I guess. Or you could. I lost it. You have it, but don't admit it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's three months ago. Well, did you get a new one? I hope you did. Anyway. But Ephesians 4.32 tells us, be kind to one another, tender-hearted. So that's the idea. 
Moving on, uh, God says there must be a distinction between the sexes. Oh, this is a good rule. A woman should not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor a man put on a woman's garment. For all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. In Genesis 1.27, it says God created man in his own image. He created them male and female. I mean, it's like this is so... Uh, this, is sh this shouldn't be an aha moment, like, ah, this should be a duh moment, right? <laughs> duh. So it's a command against cross-dressing, transvestitism, transgenderism. And listen, if we only go back, we only have to go back, let's say 20 years, just say 20. I think most people would agree with that, right? Most people agree. But it's actually today a hot topic. It, it, it just staggers. How could it be a hot topic, right? It's obvious. God created men to be men. He created women to be women. But when you have a society just like the Canaanites were and like we've become that rejects God's word, what happens is that it creates a vacuum and that, that is filled with perversion. And so in 1976, I remember it. I remember 1976. I was 16 years old. 1976, I watched the Olympics. I watched Bruce Jenner win the decathlon i remember the wheaties box that was a big thing he also graced the cover of sports illustrated magazine i i subscribed to that as a teenager that's my big thing 40 years later caitlin jenner has got the same gold medal on sports illustrated oh how we have fallen how we have fallen it's not something to celebrate as people it's something to that we should be Shamed of. Now, God talked about showing kindness to our neighbors. He now talks about showing kindness to his creation. Verse 6, if a bird's nest happens to be uh, before you along the way in any tree or on the ground, or for me, we have my, one in our backyard just built itself on the shelf this about a month. So I've been taking the ki kids out there. Hey, look at the birds. And then we see the eggs come in there and the little chicks. So, you know, it's kind of cool. But if you see that, a mother sitting with the young and the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall surely let the mother go and take the young for yourself if you want little tiny eggs to eat. That would be really tiny omelets. They were a sparrow. We let them live, you know. But you can do that. But you don't wipe them all out. Right? That's the idea. Why? One, for her sake, she could have another brood, perpetuate the, the, the species. Also, learning, listen, learning to be kind in small matters helps our ability to be kind in larger matters. So God was just saying, this is a good principle to apply to our lives. Now, moving on, we have an interesting rule. When you build a new house, <clears throat> then you should make a parapet for your roof. That's kind of like a, an edge on it. And you may not bring guilt or, or of bloodshed on your household if anyone falls from it. So God was concerned, listen to this, so check this out, when a house was built, God was concerned for the safety of others. So God was the original OSHA dude. <laughs> about, think about that. He was concerned about it. He didn't want anybody dying out of neglect. So a failure to keep your home up to code could keep another person, uh, could keep a person, you know, f losing their life. So God says when you build the roof, you know, you build an edge around it. You have a little, you know, an area, a parapet on it. See, roofs in ancient times were flat. What they do is they have a flat roof, and they usually have stairs most of the time on the outside leading up to so you can call, enjoy the cool of the day. So you'd want a, a, something up there to protect them. That was the idea. Now, the next four statements go hand in hand, and they deal with rules of separation. You should not show, uh, sow your vineyard with different kinds of seed. Verse 10, you should not plow an ox and a donkey together. You should not wear a garment of different sorts, wool and linen mixed together. Aren't you glad you're not under the law today? I mean, we have all kinds of mixed stuff. And you should make tassels on the four corners of your clothing of which you're to cover yourself. Now, the first three are negatives. Don't do this. The last one, a positive. Do this. Now, what is the reason for these, these rules, right? I mean, is there anything spiritual here? Well, the answer is yes. See, the reason why God had them do this is the Canaanites believed that in the mixing of certain things together, there was magical incantations that took place. And so God says, when you come into the land, I don't want you trusting in occultic activity. That was part of what they did. We talked about that in detail several studies ago. God says, I want you to trust in me alone. So I don't want you doing the mixing of things like they do for an ulterior purpose. 
And then he commanded to put tassels on their garden, garments, which, which Orthodox Jews do today. You'll see the tassels, their tzitzit, uh, you might call it zizit, so it's, it's really a tzitzit, is what it's called. And they have them at the edge of their garment. It was to remind them that they're a nation separate unto God. So you see that, and you see these young kids with that, and um, it's just a reminder of we're the Lord's, and we want to be people of God. So, four simple rules of separation. Now, the rest of this chapter deals with sexual immorality. And uh, don't have to tell you that we have a problem in our nation. Uh, Fulton Sheen said the Victorians, the Victorian era, you're familiar with that, uh, pretended that sex didn't exist. The modernists, though, pretend that nothing else exists. <laughs> and I agree with that. You say the word sex, people listen, right? But the reality is, sex is a good thing. Sex is a great thing when it is practiced within God's parameters. I love talking to young people. I just come out and say, first of all, listen, I just want you to know sex is awesome. They're like, whoa, the pastor's saying, yeah, sex is great. God created sex, but within the parameters of a marriage. One man, one woman for life outside of biblical uh, means outside of that that are permitted. Death, um, a, un, unbeliever departing, and so forth. But when you have sex outside of God's desire of marriage, you have a wildfire taking place. And man, I just, you see this happening. I mean, you have sexually transmitted diseases, not the least of which is AIDS. You have the various consequences such as divorce, unwanted pregnancy, even suicide. It, it always just, it frustrates me when I see programs on TV and they just talk about it like it's nothing. They never show, it's, it's always got a positive spin on it. You know what I mean? They never have the person afterwards, hey, I got AIDS. Yeah, I got sexually transmitted disease. Yeah, I passed it on to somebody else. Or yeah, I, I have an unwanted pregnancy. I want an abortion. Or I, my, I did that and now my life's in shambles. I mean, it, they don't show any of that. Why? Because sex is pleasurable. It tells us actually that in Hebrews 11.25 for a season. Sin is pleasurable for a season. But then you eventually have to reap what you sow. So God gives some clear instruction here to stay away from disaster. He says, if any man takes a wife, verse 13, and goes into her and detests her and charges her with shameful conduct and brings a bad name on her, says, I took this woman and when I came to her, I found that she was not a virgin. So she had been messing around. Sexual purity was of the utmost to God and to God's people. So let's say a man marries a wife, but then he accuses her of not being a virgin. What do you do? Then the father of the mother, the young woman, shall take and bring out the evidence of the young woman's virginity to the elders of the city at the gate. You say, what is this? Well, Warren Wiersbe had some good words. He says, quote, on the marriage night, the wise bride provided herself with a marriage cloth that would be stained with her blood at the consummation of their marriage. This would be proof that she indeed was a virgin when she was married. If later her husband said otherwise, she and her parents could present this cloth as evidence. That's exactly what we're talking right here. So if that happens, the young woman's father can say to the elders, verse 16, I gave my daughter to this man, his wife, and he detests her. Now he has charged her with a shameful conduct, saying, I found your daughter was not a virgin. Yet these are the evidences of my daughter's virginity, and they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. Then the elders of that city shall take that man and punish him. They'll fine him a hundred shekels of silver and give them to the father of the young woman because he has brought a bad name on a virgin of Israel and she shall be his wife. He cannot divorce her all his days. So it was fine and he was humiliated. However, verse 20, if the thing is true and the evidences of virginity are not found in the young woman, then they shall bring out the young woman at the door of the father's house and the men of the city would stone her to death with stones. Because she's done a disgraceful thing in Israel to play the harlot in her father's house. So you put evil from, uh, a, fr away from among you. So, man, there was a high standard of purity, right? You could see that. And so God talks about sex before marriage. He talks then about adultery. Fornication is sex before marriage between two single people. Adultery involves sex with at least one married person. Verse 22. If a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, then both of them shall die. The man that lay with the woman and the woman, you put away evil. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 27 says, Can a man take fire in his bosom and, and not be burned? The answer is, is no. 
It goes down in verse 32. It says, whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. I'll put it a simple way. If you're, in, if you're toying around with committing adultery or you're in an adulterous affair right now, you're an idiot. That's, that's another way to translate. Lacks understanding, you're an idiot because you're throwing away. And it, it actually goes on to say, he detests his own soul. You're hating your own soul to do that. You're throwing away so much blessing from God. So, man, cut that off. If that's something that's even tempting, cut it off. Stop. Now, moving on, he talks about rape. If a young woman who is a virgin is betrothed to a husband, and by the way, being engaged in that culture was the same as being married. It, you, it, if you were betrothed, you actually had to have a divorce to have the engagement annulled. So here's an engaged woman. She finds herself in a city, and a man lies with her. Then you shall bring them both out to the gate of the city, and you shall stone them with, to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry out in the city, and the man, because he humbled his neighbor's wife, you should put away the evil. So the man was obviously wrong, put to death, but why not the woman? Well, the woman was not because she didn't cry out. In other words, there's consent. But if a man finds a betrothed young woman in the countryside and the man forces her to lie with her, then only the man who lie with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the young woman. There is the young woman no sin deserving of death because when the man rises against his neighbor to kill him, even so in this manner, for he found her in the countryside and the betrothed young woman cried out, you see, but no one was able to save her. So the idea is she, she had no ill intent. Now, moving on, he says, if a man finds a young woman who's a virgin who is not betrothed. So now a guy just finds a single gal and he seizes her and lies with her and they find out. Now, the idea would be that it's consensual because he seizes her in passion. They both find out. She doesn't resist. Then the man who lie with her shall give uh, to the young woman's father 50 shekels of silver. That's, you know, the bride price. And she shall be his wife because he's humbled her. He shall not be permitted to divorce her all his days. And so they committed fornication. They need to get married. And then finally, a man shall not take his father's wife nor uncover his father's bed. In what we have here is, in this case, you have uh, a son marrying his stepmother after his father died. And in God's eyes, that was considered incest. So he forbid it. So, laws continue sexual mor morality, or immorality, actually. Uh, let's get to chapter 23. We're going to make it. The first eight verses deal with exclusions. He is emasculated by crushing. Our mutilation shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. Now, when we read about the assembly of the Lord, we're not talking about kicked out of the camp or out of the nation of Israel, but they cannot partake of the feasts and ceremonies. It was common amongst even uh, pagan cultures for men to even purposely emasculate themselves in devotion to their pagan gods. And God says, if any man even is crushed or does it purposely, he cannot partake of the the ceremonies and the feasts. Secondly, one who is of an illegitimate birth shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord. That's pretty radical. Why? He continues, an Amorite, Moabite, shall not enter the assembly of the Lord to the tenth generation. Why? Because, you know, listen, if you're in illegitimate birth, that God sees that as being a horrible thing that the, that the pagan nations do. An Ammonite, a Moabite, can't enter the assembly of the Lord up to the tenth generation. Because they didn't meet with bread and water on the road when they came out of Egypt. Because they hired uh, Balaam against you. Remember that? To curse you. Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam. Remember every time he tried to say a curse, a blessing went in his mouth. The Lord loves you. He says in verse 6, you shall not seek their peace nor their posterity all your days forever. And then he says in verse 7, you shall not abhor an Edomite though. He is your brother. So the Edomites though were the descendants of Esau. That's Jacob's brother. And so you shall not abhor him or the Egyptian because you are an alien in his land. The children of the third generation born to them may not assemble, uh, enter the assembly of the Lord. So uh, God was a little bit more gracious towards there too because the Egyptians, uh, you know, allowed them uh, by living in Goshen to become a great nation. And then, of course, uh, Edom is, Edomites were relatives. Uh, Moses talks about cleanliness, rules of cleanliness. When an army goes out against your enemies, then you keep yourself from every wicked thing. If there's any man among you who becomes unclean by some occurrence in the night, 
And then he shall go outside the camp. He shall not come inside the camp. But it shall be when evening comes, he shall wash with water. And when the sun sets, he may come back into the camp. So if a person goes off to war, he's defiled. He's touched a dead body, which would obviously happen. He has to stay outside of the camp to be cleansed. And also, you shall have a place outside of your camp where you may go out and you may have an implement among your equipment. And when you sit down outside, you shall dig with it and turn and cover your refuse. So you know what he's talking about? He's going like, well, they didn't have public restrooms back then. So what did they do? They had to go and walk outside of the camp. And he said, everybody's got to have a shovel with them. That's basically what they did. Can you imagine? Where are you going? Man, it's early in the morning. i got to go to the bathroom. You've got to walk out there. Hopefully there's no scorpions and snakes. And dig a hole, you know, and cover it up. For the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you, to give, in, uh, give your enemies over you. Therefore, your camp shall be holy. So God didn't want any of the camp to be defiled by anything from yourself or from others. He doesn't want to see any unclean thing among you that he would turn away from you. So God was concerned. And then he says this. You shall not give back to his master a slave who has escaped from his master to you. He may dwell with you in your midst in the place which he chose within one of your gates where it seems best to him. You shall not oppress him. Listen, refugee slaves would naturally want to flee to Israel. People would hear of, of, of what God, this great nation, of what God has done and the kindness of these people and, and the, the, the high standards they have. And they would become known as a compassionate society for the same reason that many refugees want to flee to the United States today. And God says when they do, you don't treat them or mistreat them, you treat them kindly. You give them sanctuary, you don't abuse them. That's a good word for us. Then he talks about prostitution. There shall be no ritual harlot of the daughters of Israel or perverted one of the sons of Israel. The worship of the Canaanites involved both male and female prostitutes. God says you do not follow after their practices. The penalty for that would be death. You shall not bring the wages of a harlot, which is a woman, or the price of a dog, that was a name for a male prostitute, to the house of the Lord your God for any vowed offering. Hey, I've given that, I've dedicated, I was with a prostitute, now I'm dedicating to Jesus. I don't, not a good thing to do. Both of them are an abomination to the Lord your God. You shall not charge interest to your brother. Here's a good one. Interest on money or food or anything that is lent out at interest. Now, to a foreigner, you can charge him interest, but to your own brother, don't charge interest that the Lord your God may bless you in all that you set your hand to do in the land that you're possessing. You know, don't, don't take advantage of your brother. That's a good word for us. Don't take advantage of your brother. Bless your brother. It's amazing. Yeah, here's a, you know, that's a pretty clear command, but there's actually ministries today. I, it, it shocks me. They're actually ministry, large ministries, and I've seen commercials. They have their own credit cards. And I thought, <clears throat> that is the most ridiculous thing. Was, first of all, that encourages debt. Credit cards encourage debt because that's what happened. And then they make like 23% of interest on it. So you're almost encouraging to make interest off your brother. Man, that's, that's, man if you see a ministry do that, that's just not Jesus. That's not the Lord, man. Moving on, God talks about rules of our speech. When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord God will surely require it of you, and, and, and it would be a sin to you. So, you know, if you swear, I'm gonna, I swear I'm going to do this, well, then you better do it. But if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be a sin to you. In other words, uh, then don't, don't make a vow, and then you're okay, is what he's saying. That which has gone from your lips you shall keep and perform, for you voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. So if you make a vow, fulfill it. That's what the Bible says. Now, Jesus said this, don't swear at all. Jesus said, don't swear at all. By heaven or earth or anything. Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. So, in other words, what Jesus was teaching is just be a person of integrity. Now, is it wrong to take certain vows? No. You, you take a vow when you stand in a court of law, hand on the Bible. You know, I promise that there's nothing wrong with that if you're going to follow through. The problem is saying something and not following through. Better to just be a person of integrity. And finally, this chapter closes with rules for travelers. When you come to your neighbor's vineyard and you eat your, uh, your fill of grapes at your pleasure... But do not put it in any container. So if you're traveling down the road, this is a cool rule. If you're traveling down the road and you see some grapes, you go, yeah, some nice grapes. You grab a whole big cluster and you just keep walking and eating them. Maybe come another one, eating them. That's pretty cool, right? You could do that. God says that's, that's good. You could do it, right? Just don't harvest them. Just don't take a big container. Hey, these are good grapes, man. Digging the grapes 
awesome grapes, right? And you got to, hey, honey, we're having, you know, whatever. <laughs> we're having grape juice or whatever you're going to make with all the grapes. Don't do that, right? When you come to your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you should not use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. So you can do just what Jesus and his disciples did in the gospel. Remember, Jesus' disciples says they were walking the fields and they were doing ding, 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 with the wheat. And they were rubbing it in their hands and they were getting some flour. I, I used to do this as a kid. I had wheat fields, <laughs> you know, thousands of acres of wheat fields across. We did that all the time. And you could do that. What you don't want to do is bring a sickle, you know, and you're chopping down a whole big thing and, and harvesting, you know. That, God says don't do that. But this was God's way of providing uh, for his people, for the poor, right? And so God had many rules to bless his people. A lot of rules and regulations here. And by the way, this is just the tip of the iceberg. He doesn't even reiterate all of them in Deuteronomy, thank goodness. But by the way, sometimes say, well, there's 10 commandments. Actually, you know how many commandments there are in the Pentateuch? There are 613. That's a lot. Now that said, as we just close, it would be very f easy for a Jew to be overwhelmed, right? If you had to remember all these laws, now what about, what was that? What is it? And how do we do that, right? Well, you, do you realize <clears throat> that you really only had to remember two, two laws? Do you know that? You only had to remember two laws in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. So I'll restate them as Jesus put it. In Matthew 22, 37, he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and with all your mind. Love the Lord your God. Love him. And the second is, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, on these two commandments hang all the law. That's it. Love God, love your neighbor. Common denominator, love. That's it. If I love God, man, I'm going to put him first in everything. That's going to take away all that stuff. If I love my neighbor, I'm not going to murder him. I'm not going to take his life. I'm not going to cheat his wife or her husband. I'm not going to do any of that. I'm going to do all the right things. Amen? So I, that's a good way to end tonight. We come away from this and go, well, how do I? There's certain things I can apply here. Yeah, look at, let's love God. Let's love others. Let's love. Let's pray.